Anything else? All right. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you for joining me at this first, I think, the first session of, of the day, first session time slot of the day. Um, I'm Jim Keller. I am one of the founding partners and the chief digital and technology officer at Eastern Standard. We are a brand and digital agency formerly based in Philadelphia and now fully remote. Uh, we work quite a bit in Drupal and other CMSs. And today I'm going to be talking about essentially about the content authoring experience in Drupal, but by way of, of visual page building experience. And I'm going to talk about it first in a little bit of a kind of conceptual way. We're going to talk a bit about tactics and kind of how Drupal approaches visual page building as well, but I think it's really important to think about it conceptually, and I'll kind of explain what I mean by that in a minute, but let's, let's rewind the clock here for a sec. So it used to be the case that the only real way to do, to set up your CMS, set up your content management was something like this, and what I mean is that you've got a series of fields, right, you've identified what content you need to bring in, and what you've essentially done is set up like a data ingestion tool, right, you've got a series of fields, and the idea is that your developers, your templates, your theme would translate these fields into something like this, right, so you've got the fields, you've got the layout, and the CMS is doing all of the work, and the configuration of the CMS and the theme is doing all the work to translate the fields into the layout. Now what that means is that the content manager's only tool, the only tool they have in their tool belt to influence the layout is the fields that they have over here. If the fields they have over here don't do something they want to do over there, they need to uh, find a developer, get help, and make that, make that leap. So we're relying on, on this, again, data ingestion tool with semantic fields and then this middle piece that translates everything into the layout. So that you can think of that as one end of the spectrum, right? So there's one end of like how we approach page building in CMSs in Drupal. It's this very data-driven, schema-driven fielded approach. Now let, let's contrast that against the other end of the spectrum. I'm actually gonna show you something from WordPress here. So this is Elementor. I don't know if people are familiar with Elementor, but if you take a look at what this is doing, right? This is the other end of the spectrum, and I think, again, it's important to think about these things at opposite ends because we're going to talk about how to wind up in the middle. But what you're looking at here is Elementor. It's a, a layout builder that sits on top of WordPress, and it really is as much a design tool as it is a content tool, right? And so we've got these two kind of competing ideas about how the content authoring experience should go and which end of the spectrum you should be on. And I think it's important to sort of fundamentally establish when you're working on a new site, when you're working in a new CMS, which end of the spectrum you're on or how you're gonna land in the middle. And to do that, I think we have to think about like what our nomenclature is when we talk about the platform, when we talk about what we're doing, because we talk a lot about content management system, right? Drupal's a CMS, it's a content management system. WordPress is a CMS, it's CMS, it's CMS. But the reality is, it's a layout management system, the way that we're building these things now. And I feel like that, that fact, that reality, is realized too late in a lot of the projects that we do, and there's a lot of missed expectations on what the content authoring experience is gonna do, how much flexibility it's gonna have, and what the content author, what, what their tools are gonna be to do that influencing of the layout that we want. And I think Drupal has you know, the, the issue that we're, we're up against you know, some of the things that folks are experiencing in WordPress and other CMSs that are really elaborate layout building tools. And that's not to say that that is the model you should follow, and we're gonna talk about why you might do one or the other. But again, I think you know, if you could take one thing away from this today, it's to think about Drupal and tools like Drupal as they're evolving, not just as content management systems, but as layout management systems. And we have to be able to admit to that and also understand how we're gonna marry the two to meet the use case that we've got in front of us. So hopefully most of you have, have moved into the, you know, the realm of design systems, right? We're building components, we're designing components. They're individual blocks on the page that get, mix, they get mixed and matched in certain ways to build layouts, right? So you've got your components, the components are designed, they have certain features and functionality, and then they're mixed and matched to use to, in, into layouts, right? But the mechanisms that we use and the mechanisms that we implement to translate that design system over into an actual layout that ends up on a website, there's a lot of cloudiness in the middle of that and how to do it. A lot of different ways to approach it, a lot of different things you can do, and I think a lot of times we get lost in, again, expectation management with, you know, if I'm working with a client and they see this design, 
how much of this can they influence or how much can't they influence? Because again, we, we know that these layout management tools like Elementor are out there and it could be the expectation that I can move this navigation bar around, I can change the header, I can do whatever I want. I can move this text up three pixels if I want, right? That could be an expectation, but a lot of times that doesn't get built that way. And then you've got you know folks who again have their expectations mismanaged, you're scrambling to add flexibility because you haven't had the right conversation. So, the thing to do up front when you're thinking about how you're going to build it, what you're going to do, is to really establish where on that continuum between content management, you know, semantic fields, and layout management you're going to live. So let's talk about like what, what the fundamental differences are, again, at the two ends of that spectrum. So on the one side, we've got content management, right? We've got single purpose fields with minimal formatting. And again, if we rewind the clock, a lot of the, you know, the initial discussions about how to, how to formulate Drupal, how to work with it, how to build the CMS, how to set up your content types and your blocks and your paragraphs was very much like granular fields with minimal formatting because you really want the theme to do a lot of the work, right? And so that's, that's where we are on this side. Single purpose fields with minimal formatting. You don't want somebody to be able to go in there and really you know, do too much that you haven't accounted for, right? The page structure is predetermined for the most part, except for the order of the blocks, and we'll talk about paragraphs and things like that, but for the most part, Page structure is very predetermined on the content management side. It's very rigid. The authors only have, again, whatever tools you've built into those fields to influence the ultimate, the layout that ultimately um, is produced. Now, it does have maximum data portability, and we'll talk about this a little later, which is um, you're not intrinsically tying your design and your content together um, because that is, in some cases, a bad idea and you don't want to do it. So when you have this fielded content, you've got stuff that is sitting in fields, you've got data, you can move it around, you can send it to other systems, you can migrate it, you can manipulate it, and you can do things with it that's a lot more difficult if you've got formatting embedded in with your content. And so if you need to move it around, suddenly you've got a lot of parsing to do and you start questioning why you set things up like this in the first place and then, you know, be because you didn't have this, this conversation with yourself or with your team. Um, the onus here is on the designers and the developers to map the fields to the templates in a consistent, flexible way. So to do this enormous mapping exercise to make sure that there's an understanding of what the content is and is going to be. And then the development team, the design team needs to make sure that they're doing that mapping again of those fields into the layout. Right? So this is what the content management side looks like. Over on the layout management side, We've got, you know, fields can have a lot of styling and formatting applied. Um, and then this can go, go all the way into like padding margins, you know, font size, positioning, things like that. You saw the Elementor demo and you can see that there's, you know, a lot of opportunity to have styling and formatting applied to the fields. So they're, they're much less rigid within themselves. Um, you know, an individual hero, for example, can have all kinds of different options for how you can manipulate the layout. Um, again, and this is kind of the, the similar point, but the straight page structure is managed alongside the content in a lot of ways. So instead of the theme being the kind of source of truth for exactly what the page structure is going to be, you've got page structure being managed alongside the content. The content and presentation are intrinsically linked. So again, talking about data portability, you've now made the decision that your formatting and your content are kind of merged together in a way that's not necessarily going to be easy to separate later. That could be OK or it could be not OK, depending on what your use case is. Um, Pages are almost infinitely flexible, but the onus of layout management falls on the content editor. So the content editors tend to have to do a lot of work or, you know, uh, to, depending on how you've set it up, a lot of work to manage the layout on a page by page basis. So instead of the design and the theme doing the work to generate the page in a very specific way and maintaining that design integrity, there's more onus on the content editors to understand how to manipulate the design and get to do what they want to do even if that, you know, there, there's flexibility there, but it comes at the expense of this kind of additional layer of what you're doing when you're managing content. So the question becomes, like, wh which one of these do you choose, right? How, how do you know what to do? And the answer is that you don't choose one, you choose a balance, right? You figure out specifically what you need to do, what the use case is, and what you're going to provide, and identify where you're going to sit on that continuum between content management and layout management. It's not a binary choice. It's a continuum, and again, it depends on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what, you're, what the long term of it's going to be in terms of how, how you think about which side you're going to be on. And to help you think about what, what kinds of questions you need to, oh, oh my goodness, keep your seats. All right, here we go. Um, what kinds of questions do you need to ask 
in order to determine like where, where should this project fit on this continuum, right? So what's the right blend of flexibility and content portability? So a couple of questions here. There's more in here as well, but just a few to get, to get started here. You know, will, will it serve more than one front end? So if you're looking to port your content, let's say you know, you've got Drupal and it's driving a, a website, a standard website through a theme, it's also going to drive app content or it's going to integrate with Salesforce. You know, it's going to move data back and forth. This is an important question because if you're driving more than one front end, tying your layout and your presentation together is probably not the best idea. Um, and so that's one of the questions you need to ask when you're thinking about this layout versus content approach. Um, again, is the CMS the source of truth or is data coming from external sources? A lot of times you've got Drupal setups that are pulling data from some other system, an ERP, you know, a physician database or you know, a faculty database, whatever the case may be, and chances are that data coming from wherever it is is probably more semantic, it's more isolated, it's more kind of schema driven. And so is that something that we're gonna have to deal with? Are we gonna be moving data around in between systems because that lends itself more to that content approach? Question here, do, do content managers have web and UX savvy and to what degree? So you can give folks a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different things and you know, kind of give them the opportunity to really screw things up if they're not careful and don't know what they're doing. And so the question is, the people that are managing the content, are they A, comfortable, and B, willing to do the level of kind of design exercise they need to do page to page? Because a lot of times that's not really what they signed up for. Some of them do. Some people are like, no, like we get it. And we've had conversations with clients where they're like, we understand that you are giving us enough rope to hang ourselves with. We're going to be careful with it. Right? So we, we know that there are folks out there who are like, listen, we want our own flexibility knowing that we have to control ourselves. But if that's not really what the content editing folks signed up for, or they just don't, they're like, I, I don't really know how to put this page together with all these different tools and options, I feel kind of stymied. Um, you can train them, you can help them out, but a lot of times finding a better balance is the way to approach that question. So do we have a strong understanding of the content and the use cases? And this comes into your design system planning and a lot of your content planning, which is like, do we know enough about what people are likely to be doing with their content to really make it more rigid, or do we have to leave it flexible simply because we don't know what the use cases are and what they're going to want to do? Right? Are there are there areas where we know a lot, areas where we know little? Can we put a lot of rigidity over here and a lot of flexibility over there? And so thinking about that as you're going into this is, you know, have we audited the content and the use cases to understand the best way to approach what we're doing here? How much are we willing to put the integrity of the design at risk? So this is this is an interesting question because again, you know, you see you know demos of Elementor and other layout builders, and people are like, that that is what I want. That's that's that looks amazing. I can do everything I want there, and you, I won't have to come back to you for anything. But again, you know, you can do a lot of damage to the design. You have the the situation where you know you you go to a page, right, and you somebody was feeling very purple that day, right? They just that was just it was purple that day. And you see, you know, what you thought was your beautiful and you know well-crafted design, and it's it's like the Godfather. It's like, look what they've done. My, you know, they massacred my boy. Like, you just see this page, and you're like, that's that's not at all what we intended. How did you even do that? <laughs> and and sometimes we've been surprised where it's like, that's really clever. I have no idea how you found your way around what we've built enough to make it look. That, where did you find Comic Sans? How did you do that? Right. So. How much of the design integrity are you willing to put at risk? How much do we trust the content editors to, uh, you know, to do what they need to do to make sure that they're they're not, you know, introducing these other other design problems? So let's talk about Drupal's answer to layout management, and I'll use answer kind of abstractly because I don't think I don't think there's an answer, and I actually think that there's a lot of work that kind of needs to be done here. But there's been a lot of attempts and a lot of motion, a lot of good things done in this direction but I still think that there's, there's ways to go. And I'm gonna show you kind of where we've landed on this, this conversation and how, how we're doing our layout management, where we tend to fit on the continuum and kind of how, how we've customized some things to suit our purposes. So let's talk about paragraphs first. Um, is anybody not familiar with the paragraphs module? So it's, it's probably the most unfortunately named module in Drupal's, Drupal's ecosystem. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to find another one. There's nothing really to do with paragraphs, but okay, so most people are familiar with it. Paragraphs took the concept of, of managing fields, so managing fielded data, right? But it compartmentalized into individual components and blocks that can then be moved up and down on the page, right? So as I'm creating this page, I've got these different options. And actually, this, this screen, which is the paragraphs enhanced editor, shows it a little better. So I've got 
like my my options over here for things I can put on the page, and then they show up here, and I can order them, and I can move them around, and I can edit them using fields. And this this was a big step forward. I mean, it, it really was, and I think probably most of us, I know we were using paragraphs very heavily, still use it, but I'll show you kind of how we've we've evolved it. Um, but there's some drawbacks here. I mean, the, the, the first thing is, okay, so I can, I still have to sort of mentally conceptualize what's happening here, right, as I'm building the page. It's like I've got, I've got image, I've got, a, I've got a horizontal line, right, okay, putting that in there. Um, so as I'm building the page, I don't really get that immediate feedback of what the page actually looks like and what it's gonna do. And so again, step forward, and it still allowed us to maintain a lot of integrity, a lot of the fielded semantic data stuff, but giving a little bit of flexibility to move things around. And so paragraphs, um, still a very powerful tool, and if you're using them, the, the advanced editor and some of the other modules you can put on top of it, give it a little bit more sugar, make it a little bit nicer, which is like what you're seeing here. Now, Layout Builder. This one's interesting. Is anybody using Layout Builder? Okay. Um, all right, good. I need to know who my, who my hecklers are going to be. So Layout Builder is interesting. Um, it sort of takes it a step further, and you can now have these you know, kind of large sections on the page. You can add sections, you can add blocks to them, and you can manipulate things. Do I have another screenshot here? Yeah, okay, so we'll get there in a second. Um, I, I personally have not found Layout Builder to be the right tool. People have used it successfully, and I know that there are folks in here who may, you know, like we can get into it in the Q&A, right? Because I'm, I'm actually curious to see how folks have managed to use it because I, I find that there are at least two main drawbacks. One, and I know there are ways around this, so, you know, this is not, you know, this is this is my, couched in this is my opinion of, of Layout Builder having used it to some degree and found that it was lacking and kind of preemptively moving on to something else. So Layout Builder does like to use blocks as the fundamental kind of page building element, Drupal blocks, not like abstract design system blocks, but actual Drupal blocks. And that always struck me as kind of strange given like how Drupal works and how typically we've been managing content has not usually been through the block system. So that, that's the first thing that, that struck me as a little bit strange and you know, blocks are obviously fieldable now, right? They're a lot better than they were in like Drupal 7 and things like that. So they're very fieldable and you can use them, but they still to me and you know, I think just even using it feel a little bit strange as like the primary building block of the page. The other thing that Layout Builder, I think, doesn't quite do right, and you can see that you know some of these concepts we're talking about are here, right? Um, you can get you know different columns, and you can choose your column layouts, you can choose different widths and things like that, and you can get some sense of what the front end is looking right. So we're making we're making progress here, um, but the the other place that it falls down is I feel like it it kind of gives you an approximation of what the front end is going to look like. It gives you just enough tools to hang yourself, but not enough tools to really do what you want to do. And I've always found it to be kind of a mid middling solution. Again, I am totally open to other opinions on it. See, these, these already upset. You know, <laughs> like, like, I, can't, I can't listen to this layout building nonsense. You know? <laughs> um, so I'm open to opinions if other folks have found it to be, uh, to be more useful. But um, I was excited about Layout Builder. We you know, tried it and found that it just wasn't quite there. And it certainly wasn't quite comparable as a demo against something like Elementor or, the, you know, or Gutenberg, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is WordPress's kind of out-of-the-box editor. And I think that's one of the challenges we have right now in Drupal as a whole is we don't get the chance a lot of times to have these kinds of conversations when folks are choosing CMSs. We don't get deep into the, the idea of like, well, is it layout management or is it a content management system? How's your feel? What's your data setup? You know, we, we're up against these demos where folks are like, that looks amazing and this doesn't, mm -hmm. right? And that's just fundamentally an issue that we have trying to, you know, promote Drupal and sell Drupal into the, into the marketplace. And I think that that's why this conversation to us is kind of so, so pressing because you know, we, we are doing a lot of both WordPress and Drupal. We have those conversations a lot. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how folks respond to them. Drupal still has this, you know, this kind of backstory that may or may not be true about, like, it's harder to use. It's more difficult to use for some reason than, than WordPress mm -hmm. is. And I think that that is only true if it's set up a certain way. But I do think that, you know, there, there's still a lot to go in terms of how you set up the visual building. So let's talk about something else. So there's layout paragraphs. Because this is interesting. Have anybody used this one? Okay. All right. Good. Good. Um, so layout paragraphs is interesting because it really starts to give you a better place in that continuum to live. There are still some drawbacks, but you can work around them. So layout paragraphs takes kind of that that sense of being able to kind of map the layout in your content authoring experience to paragraphs that you're creating. So you still have these like fielded, ni nice isolated individual paragraphs. You create them individually. You have fields that you set up, and you don't have to like 
manipulate the pixels on the screen. I think that's something that we, we want to avoid generally is an authoring experience where the content editors have to like manipulate individual pixels. So it still, re it still respects your templates. It still allows you to do paragraphs. Um, and it allows you to start laying them out. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Okay. Um, and this is kind of the, the basis for, for the solution that we're using now, but we've added some stuff to it to kind of bring it up to the next level. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So what we've done, because we like layout paragraphs, we like where it fits in that continuum. Um, we like using paragraphs as the primary building block as opposed to Drupal blocks. Um, they're still good, they're still good field identities, they still work really well, um, but we want to give this visual experience. So what, what we've done is we've taken layout paragraphs and unless something's changed since I put this together, out of the box, it gives you kind of a general representation of your front end. But this isn't really your front end, is it? This isn't really your website. Um, and so what we've done is, you know, with some clever ways of attaching libraries and things, um, actually, pause there for a second. I was gonna show you, um, you know, one of the things that's been influence, influencing us in the direction that we're going. So this is Gutenberg. This is WordPress's block editor. And while the implementation under the hood of Gutenberg leaves a lot to be desired, um, the experience is kind of, again, where we like to fit on that spectrum between layout and content. So it's essentially a fielded block approach where you've got a lot of ability to do things. Once, once you start getting into more complicated blocks and things, you've got fields. And so this was kind of our, our inspiration a little bit for, okay, what do we want to do with Drupal? Um, we want to see something where it's constrained by, by templates, it's constrained by layouts, but there, and there's fields, you can see fields over there. But there's a lot of flexibility here, and there's you know a lot of uh, a better experience. So, taking some some cues from you know what we liked about what Gutenberg was doing, um, we added into layout paragraphs, and I'll show you what it looks like now with layout paragraphs, you know, configured kind of a specific way with paragraphs that we created, but also with the front end theme rendering on the back end, and kind of this, this is you know one of the things that we spent some time on figuring out. So you can watch me slowly go through adding content here. So. I apologize, but you know, my presentation is not that long, so. Um, I'm editing a paragraph here, so I'm creating a new call to action. You can see I've got this little pop-up above my main content editing experience, right? I'm gonna scroll down, put in my link, and then I'm gonna go and save. So I'm, I'm still doing fields, right? I'm still doing fields, that's cool. Um, but once I go and save it, we've actually got the front end rendering at this point. And so we're able to give a, a realistic look of what the front end is looking like as this thing is coming together without adding in all those other challenges of giving people the ability and the risk of you know, having to manipulate the page like pixel to pixel. So you can see here as they're building it, these are the actual front end templates driving these paragraphs that are being rendered through layout paragraphs as the experience is being edited. Um, there's a couple different ways to approach that. Um, I know other folks have done it. Um, our, our approach was you know, for, for the developers that, that are in the room, um, our components are actually modules, like all, all the individual paragraphs are set in modules, and we're attaching libraries, uh, we're adding libraries through those modules, because then we can attach them to the backend theme. We can add libraries, we can attach libraries, attach, you know, Drupal libraries, meaning the, um, the CSS and the JavaScript that's attached to this, this paragraph block in the backend. Sorry. Go ahead. It, so you're not using the same theme, it's two different themes, your backend theme is still... Correct, okay. correct. I will say, um, one of our initial approaches to doing this was a little bit more, more hacky in that we, the first thing we tried to get this to work was to make our front end theme a sub theme of Jin, which is the admin theme that we're using. Um, that actually did work okay. Um, I think the, the, only, the only reason that it was a little suspect and you know, that was my idea by the way and it was kind of shot down by the developers. They were like, it works, it works, but like conflicts in CSS, like basically the, the whole admin theme is on the front end now. Um, but that was our first approach and that did kind of work. So basically um, we were using the front end theme to edit content, but the front end theme was a sub, sub theme of our admin theme. And so that was the first approach. This, this one is much better. Um, it doesn't have that potential conflict. And you can see here as we're, just, as we're defining um, what, what our page structure is gonna be and what options we're gonna have, we're giving them column options, right? But we're constraining even what, what options are inside those columns. So I'm going to go back there. Um, yeah, so within the columns, we're defining, okay, not everything works within two columns. This is one of the things that you run into when you just like open up Gutenberg or you open up one of these big layout tools and there's 9,000 possible blocks and you've explicitly designed 17 of them 
but somebody, one of the content managers, was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know I could do this. This seems like an interesting concept. I'll just, I'll just start growing photo galleries inside columns. I'll create a three-column layout. You never intended that in the design. So we're able to control which paragraphs are within which other paragraphs, and we create kind of these these sub blocks. Um, and again, you can see kind of how this, this shakes out. So we've got, you know, um, obviously that's a pretty basic block, but we've got two columns. We've got images and text. So this is how we've been solving the problem of how do we create a visual editing experience that doesn't allow for you know completely nightmarish um, like design loss of design integrity as we move forward. So that's kind of where where we've landed. So our answer to the question is to use layout paragraphs and to attach your front end theme CSS as libraries to the back end so that the content editors can see it as it's coming through. Um, now there's some questions though about how, how do you actually get there, right? Because we're still we're still doing a lot of definition of what's available in that back end. And we again like what, what works within two columns? What doesn't work within two columns? You know, how how have we intended the content managers to do this? And if you think about how many different blocks there are probably 19, 20 blocks on that that site, how many different possible permutations there are. You, you get into an almost infinite number of possible per permutations. So how do you start controlling that? How do you design the system so that this stuff doesn't all have to get figured out in the implementation phase? And that's one of the one of the other key things I think to take away here is that these conversations need to need to start way before the implementation phase. Because a lot of times that's where they land and then you end up, you know, how did you blow your development budget? Why is it taking so long? It's because these things weren't figured out and assessed beforehand. And that's one of the things I, I really want to stress here. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we do it, how we make sure that our developers know going into it, our clients know going into it, our content managers know going into it, what degree of flexibility we have built into the system and what you will and won't be able to do. So this is an example of one of, one of our Figma mockups. Again, I'm hoping most of you are, are, or all of you are doing design systems at this point. But you can see we design our individual blocks and components. Most of this is probably not new. Um, and we go through and we think about what the individual blocks are going to do, what they're going to say, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and we do the, the design system layout. And then we also show sample layouts for how these blocks might come together um, to form layouts. Side note, this is something that I think is really critical when you're doing design systems. Um, which is folks have a lot of difficulty conceptualizing a lot of times how those specific components are going to come together to form the layouts they want to form, even in the design process. And so creating sample layouts and being able to say, listen, you can do a lot with this landing page. You can do a lot with this program page. But generally speaking, this is how we recommend you set it up. These are, these are the six blocks you should use. This is why. This is how it is. And so when we do our design systems, we also do a lot of layouts, a lot of sample layouts to get to the fact that like this is probably what a landing page is going to look like. Yes, you can remove this. Yes, you can change this. Yes, you can do whatever you want. But generally speaking, this is what it's going to be. Just because that way you're not asking folks to mentally make, again, make that jump in conceptualizing how this design system is going to come together. The challenge that I think often comes up is this is essentially the extent of the documentation developers sometimes get. It's like, here's a ticket. Here's the design. Right? This is what it is. Make it work. And so they're, they're left to a lot of interpretation as to what the intended flexibility is going to be, what the options are going to be. Can I change the background of this whole component? Background color? Maybe. I don't know. Can I have more than one call to action down there? I don't know. Um, and these conversations need to be had up front, need to be passed on to the developer. Otherwise, again, you're, you're chasing them, right? As soon as, the, as soon as the content starts flowing, people start using the system, all of a sudden you're having conversations that should have happened six months ago. And so the way that we address this is we map everything we're going to do throughout the entire process, the, the content process, the design process, into what we call our requirements. We use Airtable, so you're seeing Airtable. If you haven't used it, it's like a spreadsheet plus plus. Um, and so we will take all of the blocks and components that we, we've designed. We will work with the developers. We'll work with the, the content team. We'll even work with our SEO specialists to be like, what can these things do? What can't they do? And so for every component, you see you've got an example of what it looks like. There's a link to the Figma documentation. There's a general use case, right? Like, you know, similar to the 50-50, use with accordion, use to add accordion. And then we actually map the fields. These are the fields that are going to be present in the CMS. And doing this exercise is a little bit laborious, um, but it brings to bear every one of these conversations that you need to have prior to moving into implementation. We're going through this with, with this client right now. And even though designs are finished, 
the amount of questions that we're drumming up by having these conversations with them is staggering. Because again, with questions like, well, for example, can I change the background color of this component? Like the, 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 let's say it's a call to action or something. It's like, yes, okay, which colors can I have? Well, all of the brand colors. Okay, but the heading text is white. Do all of the brand color backgrounds work with white heading text? Do we need to give that option as well? You start to extract these things. What's the, what's the character limit on this field? Do we want one that's like super long? Are we cool with that or are we not? And if we're not, are we gonna truncate it? Or are we gonna set a hard character limit? If we set up our character limit, how are we dealing with the fact that it's not a fixed width font? It's a variable width font, and so character limits are kind of ambiguous. So all these conversations come up, and they all get documented here. And this, this starts in wireframes for us. So as soon as we start thinking about wireframes and how things are gonna be laid out, we start this requirements documentation. And so that way, what you don't wanna do is wait until like design's finished and then start this. Okay, we, we used to do it that way. Nobody wants to do this all at once in like a week, right? This, 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 you're seeing a tiny snippet of a giant air table that collects a lot of information as we're going through. Doing it iteratively is pretty easy. We do our designs and feature sets. We're saying we're going to do these six components. We're going to, we're going to wireframe, we're going to design them, we're going to get you know, feedback on, we're going to work with them, then we're going to start documenting them. And then as they're being documented, the next set is being in wireframe. So we do this in kind of an iterative fashion because if you leave all this stuff to the end, nobody wants to do it, it doesn't get done. And then you're left in the same position where you're struggling to finish this documentation while you've got to build things and so you haven't helped yourself anyway. Right, another example, this is actually for our own website. We redid our own website last year. And just to give you a sense of you know, the amount of information we are collecting through this process. Um, and that is how we determine, okay, moving into implementation, we feel comfortable with the amount of flexibility here, with how things are gonna relate to one another. Um, and it also brings up questions like, for example, let's say you've got a layout and you've got faculty you know, bios and headshots at the bottom, right? One of the mistakes that people make a lot of times is you have your page and you have a paragraph called like faculty bio headshots, right? So you add them to the page. They're on another page, right? They're in another department. What, you gotta add them again? Um, so the question of like, well, is this, is, this, is faculty its own entity that then gets referenced by this, by this block or not? Because you don't wanna be entering content twice. And so this process extracts all of that, brings it to the forefront, makes those conversations happen. And again, by not doing it all at once, by doing it alongside your design process, you don't overload people. Um, again, we're doing it in individual feature sets with different pieces of content. Um, and you can see, you know, kind of how we track status and things like this. And I would say sometimes this is just an internal artifact, so we don't share it with our clients. If we're working with a client team that has developers or maybe they're going to be developing the site or something like that, or they're just, you know, structured in a way where this is something that they're going to be able to internalize, understand, and provide meaningful feedback on, we'll bring them right into this. So, you know, the development team for the client I was just referencing, you know, they're, they're involved in the project, and so they're providing feedback on it. Um, and in fact, in one project, we actually created a, a special view of this sheet that literally exported Jira tickets. So we actually just, like, were able to take the user stories that we've got, the titles, the components, the links, and just export it into Jira and create our sprints that way. So, again, it looks very laborious. It is a lot to add to the project, but if you do it in increments, it's really not that bad. So, okay, I'm doing okay on time, all right. Um, so I'm gonna do a little recap um, as we, we kind of close out here and then start, we'll start some Q&A, but um, just to kind of bring it back together. So, you know, deciding as early as possible the degree to which your authoring experience will be content management versus layout management. And this is something that has to be understood at the most basic level in terms of what, what, your, what your team is expecting, what your clients are expecting, whoever's gonna be the content managers, what are they expecting based on what they've seen, what they've experienced, and what they expect. So. Again, there's not, there's not a correct way to answer this. For example, we, we built a, a head, completely headless site, so React and Next.js on the front end um, needed to be shipping data back and forth between the front end, very heavily fielded site. Um, getting, getting previewing working with kind of, was kind of interesting. We had to kind of do some custom stuff, but when you're doing headless, you've got a front end that's completely separate from your back end. So the CMS is not generating the front end. So the front end is talking to the CMS as if they were separate systems and then rendering stuff on the front end. So for that use case, very fielded approach, not very layout management -y. Now obviously we're kind of bringing in like field options that say like, is this two column or three column when it shows up on the front end? But there's not a lot of visual layout management happening there. Um, set the expectations with the content managers up front as you're talking about it. Um, give them some documentation, give them some ways to understand what this is gonna look like. 
establish and document the content editing features and components and blocks during the design process or you wireframing during the content process, start as early as possible so you understand what it's going to be because you don't want surprises. You don't want surprises when the content start is going in because I'm guessing that you've probably experienced the situation where content is going in a little bit later than you would have hoped. Uh, it's a little bit more of, uh, of an effort than you would have hoped. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be uncovering implementation details you should have thought of while that is happening, while everybody's you know, anxious to get something launched, get the content moved in. Um, try different modules and combinations of modules to see, see what works. Um, again, we, we were playing with this, we were doing different things, and we landed on this kind of hybrid layout paragraphs approach. There may be other things out there, there may be things I'm not even aware of. I know there's been a lot of work happening in this space, um, and so, you know, I'm certainly happy to hear from anybody if they've found something that works for them. Um, and then that last one is actually not supposed to be there, so I'm going to skip that. Um, <laughs> all right, I think I'm good on time. I think we can switch over to q and I had some other, uh, other slides here in case we need to fill some time, but um, I'm going to open up for Q&A. Thank you so much for listening to my talk, and, uh, you know, please feel free to ask any questions either now or later in the day if you run into me, but let's, let's get it started. So we're heavily invested in layout paragraphs already. <laughs> Okay. And tried in Drupal 9 to use Mercury mm. Batten that, that, that maintains layout paragraphs. Yeah, yeah. Have you looked at that? It, like, it's similar to what you're doing, but it takes a very different approach. So I'm going to repeat the question, um, which is um, essentially they're using layout paragraphs and they're looking at, looking at Mercury, or have we, you used we, Mercury? We tried to implement it in 9, ran into too many issues, okay. off, and now we're looking at it again in 10. So I would say. Conceptually, Mercury. So Mer Mercury is sort of uh, what would you call it? Like a, a sort of solution on top of layout paragraphs by the group that built layout paragraphs that kind of brings it up to the level of, of what we're doing here in our custom solution. It's very nice. Um, so I haven't actually tried it. Here's why. Um, it looks like it's the right thing. I would recommend that people try it. I I'm always worried about big elaborate pieces that sit on top of Drupal that are maintained by like a single company or are not quite mature yet because, I don't know, did anybody else use Lightning? Anybody else using Lightning for media management? There's not any Oppie people in the room, are there? Oh, no, he's gonna die. So, like, so we had sites that were heavily, heavily built on Lightning. They got shuttered, right? Upgrading a Lightning site to a non-Lightning site during the time when media management was all changing in like Drupal mm -hmm. 8, 9? Um, yep. You know, so. yeah, it was. Been there, uh, done that. It was not fun. So that's my only trepidation right this second about Mercury. Yeah. I think it is the the right. It's it's where I would go with this. I just don't yet feel comfortable basing a site around it at this moment. No, that's great. Um, so up? we're in the same boat. Uh, we're using Mercury. Okay. Drupal 10. It's working really good. Okay. You can just uninstall it. Mm. It just defaults right back to layout paragraphs. So okay. They, that was a big thing that I was concerned too because I felt like a very proprietary solution. Right, right. But you can remove it and everything works. Okay. You lose the editing experience that's on top of it. But yeah, yeah. That work as layout progress. Uh, so it's really come a long way for sure. Yeah, and that's and you know it's it's definitely something that you know I, I plan on looking into more because you know we're we're not interested in customizing things if there's a solution out there obviously, um, but one of the things we do try to do is when we do customizations and when we try to bring new things we really try to make it so that it's not it's not something really proprietary like I, I always say like I just want it to be a very clever way of configuring things that already exist as opposed to a layer on top that you know needs to be kind of its own separate thing. That's why like in WordPress we, we're leaning toward Gutenberg as opposed to other solutions because Gutenberg's kind of baked in, right? And we've added some customizations on top of that too to do some of the same kinds of things we want to do, but we try to stick in the like, okay, this is just clever configuration of the system. It is not a new thing on top of it because we've been burned in the past. Um, but that being said, I, I do think, like I said, Mer Mercury is, in my view, thinking about this the right way, and probably, you know, as it as it gains even more traction, will will probably be the the way to do this. So we had a pretty similar path from paragraphs to something else. Mm -hmm. We went with layout builder, mm -hmm. and we ran into a very like pertinent issue with like layout builder in general, where our content users don't understand the difference between like editing a node and being in layout builder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that something that Right, right, right. So the question is, and I, I didn't actually bring that up, highlight that as a as a challenge with layout builder. The question is about so in layout builder, 
Um, you can edit the node, so it's kind of like the old school node editing, or you can be in the layout editor. And it's not immediately clear to folks, right, like which, which one they're doing and why. Um, this doesn't have that, that issue because what you were seeing is the only editor that's available. There's not like another view of it. That's another issue with, with Layout Builder is that you can still have like a fundamental node, but then you also have this other layer on top of it. That's also true in Elementor. So I don't know if you ever use Elementor, but it's like you can edit your WordPress post or you can edit with Elementor and it, you know, pops up this extravagant thing. Uh, somebody else, sorry, somebody else had a question. I want to make sure I'm missing anybody. All right, you're good. So Layout Paragraph Library, are you not... You're saying that you're only editing when you're in the page experience, but we've had the issue where people who don't understand reusable content mm -hmm. are editing the paragraph in a library, not understanding all of the pages that are being impacted by the changes they're making. I mean, that that's largely like a training and governance issue as far as like whether or not, again, it kind of goes back to that, that question about faculty profiles, like mm -hmm. is this part of my page or is this being brought in elsewhere from the page? And I think that I don't have like a, I don't have a technical solution for that. I mean, I imagine you know I could think of something where you mark it a certain way or put a border around it in the editor or something, but I don't have a, a good answer for the question of like how how do people know when they're building a page whether the paragraph they're using is coming from like a centralized repository of existing paragraphs or whether it's on their page because it's kind of like if, if you're familiar with Figma at all when you're doing design systems you have your like components sets in a library and then you apply them to a page. And you can override them on the page, but if you edit them within the page, you can risk like you know sending it back to the mothership. Basically, yeah. I don't have a good solution for that outside of content and governance, but it's certainly worth thinking about. And I think that you know again, even some visual cue that this is not this is not yours mm -hmm. to, to work with is probably a good idea. So I, I'm a little confused by your distinction between paragraphs and blocks because on the data level, they're both field mm -hmm. entities. So is it the data structure? the tools around them that, that you see is the difference between blocks and paragraphs. So don't forget to repeat the question. Oh, yes. So the question is, what, what's my, basically, what's my problem with blocks? When, <laughs> when an un, underlying, like, on the software level, they're, they're essentially the same thing. They're fielded entities. I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, it, it might actually be, like, prior Drupal knowledge of how blocks were and what they were used for. Um, and just maybe the way that Layout Builder kind of situates them in, in the editor. I, I don't have a great solution, or a great answer for why it doesn't feel like the right solution to me, and that's why I kind of qualified it as like, I know other folks are, are doing this differently, um, but it's just, I don't know, the, the blocks seem to be kind of something different in Drupal. They were always something different in Drupal outside of your core content management, and kind of bringing them into that always felt kind of strange to me. It might have something to do with the actual interface, but I, I will I will be open to you know people saying like you should just you should just use blocks. It just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, just have my perspective. Yeah, it always seems like blocks are tied to your theme, so we should mm -hmm. just lay out um, the helps do that. They're also exportable as configuration, which is right. not normally what con we we draw the line by something that can be reverted within the CMS instance versus something that can be deployed. And so if it's owned by the content managers, it needs to be revertible within the CMS without having to roll back a merge. And so that's where blocks, like you're inherently working against the way the CMS wants you to use blocks if you treat them like content. You could ignore all the block config export for that. I'm closer to him in the room, he's not buying it. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm curious with your clients, is this your default approach? Like, is there a percentage wherein you're like, yeah, we're giving them configuration options for like number of columns? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's often a question for our teams whether that's even a door you should open for right, right. some clients. So I'm curious, just like in your experience, where are you seeing your client base in terms of like actively demanding mm -hmm. or being able to handle sort of like the abstraction and the options for visual layout? It, it depends a lot. Um, again, like you know, I, we were recently talking to a client who was saying like 
we don't want maximum flexibility. We have maxim maximum flexibility now and it ruined everything, right? And that, that's a really like mature attitude to have about it for somebody who's been through it before. And so this is kind of where we try to maneuver things, but there are absolutely outliers and there are, there are folks who get more options, less options. Um, and you know, it really depends on what the client needs are. So we do tend to do a fair bit of like selectable options that are still within our design system. You know, again, not, not making you pixel move things around, but I would say it's our default in the sense that it's where we try to land, but there's always room for outliers depending on the use case. And so it's, it's very dependent because like, um, even this approach is actually somewhat new for us. I mean, you know, like everybody else, we were doing Kyra Rush for a while, we tried Layout Builder, and now, now we're doing this, but um, it's highly dependent on the use case. And that's again why it's like a whole conversation. Thank you, Jim. Uh, with all that flexibility, what's the impact on accessibility requirements? So the question is, uh, I, I'm trying to repeat it. The question is, what, what is the impact on accessibility requirements? That to me is almost similar to the design integrity question, which is like, how are you maintaining design integrity? Because so much of the accessibility stuff is coming from the front end, right? Um, and I think it, it's all part of the same conversation is, if you are giving them too much control to do things outside of accessibility, then you can be in trouble. But I would say there's always going to be a governance layer on top of that because even if you have it pretty well locked down, you still got things like heading order and, yeah. and, and colors and contrast mm -hmm. and things that you're you're never like you're never going to give so little flexibility that people like can't put headings on the page, right? And so there's always a layer of governance around accessibility when doing content. And then the question about accessibility being baked in is again back to that design integrity. Like how much of your templating is driving what's showing up on the front end versus how much of what's chosen in the CMS. And so to me, it's, it's all part of that. And that, that's one of the reasons we don't like to open the door too wide because, you know, we look at, you know, some of the, the truly layout managed websites and it's like, if, if you wanted me to make this accessible because things start to break down, especially across multiple pages, you know, so I'll, I'll, let me reframe that. So when you're dealing with accessibility, a lot of times you have the convenience of like, oh no, the scanner found 28,000 issues because there's four in the header and you've got 5,000 pages, right? So you've really got four or five issues, you solve them once and all of a sudden your scanner's much happier, right? When people have been screwing around independently with the layout of every individual page, you don't have that like economy of scale. You've got to go into every page and, you know, just be like, what, what has happened here now? This is different from the last one. So I think when you're thinking about how rigid you're making it, part of the question is not, when we talk about design integrity, it's not just, does it look the way I wanted it to look? It's, is the accessibility also accounted for and baked in? Oh, oh. I think we're at time, but. Uh, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Feel free to find me out there. I appreciate you coming.